It's such a pleasure to be back with Film Independent. This really feels very homey to me. So it we does. Did, I'm we so did glad. We did a Q&A like to almost 12 years ago. We did. We did. So for, for Tiny Furniture. And we look exactly the same as we did then. Yeah. I mean, hardly anything's happened between then and now, has <laughs> Literally it? Literally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my notes. I have a tendency to forget things in my old age and also, I think, because of covid Oh, um, welcome to my... I don't even have, like, any good excuse for why I have a tendency <laughs> to forget that. My, on my uh, onset notes are such a intense, deranged scribble series that no one else... And if I lose them, I become uh, cataclysmic, and yet I constantly lose them. So yeah. I applaud your notes. I take more notes now in this time of my life than I ever did before, like, even when I was in school, even when I was in classes. I mm -hmm. keep notes of life. <laughs> I really Just get constantly. it. My notes app. If anybody wants to talk about their love of notes app later, I'm around. You can hashtag things now. It's great. I didn't know that. I'll have to check that out. We'll talk. Um, so since uh, so many film independent members are aspiring filmmakers. Which I love. I love to ask the aspiring filmmaker story. So um, do you want to talk about how you became a filmmaker? Is that originally what you set out to do? You know, I. it's funny. I started in a way so young that now I look back and I think, how could I have set out to do anything before that? I was like basically fetal, but at the time it felt like a real idea that I suddenly had. I was, um, I always loved to write and I always wrote as um, a kid. I was always like, if there was ever, you know, an irritating poetry or playwriting elective you could sign up for or a lit mag you could submit to or I was incessantly sending things to like Stone Soup, the national children's literature magazine and getting polite rejection notes six months later. Um, and when I went to college in, at Oberlin in Ohio, I studied creative writing and film studies, and I thought that I wanted to be a playwright. And I was like, that is a way that, I think I, th I thought what so many of us thought, which is like, I, did, I knew I loved movies, but I didn't know who made them or how you would make them. I knew that I was lucky in that my parents are artists, and so I thought a creative life was a possibility, which I realize now was such a, a very blessed advantage because so many people, and I'm sure many of you, come from families where the idea of pursuing something creative is considered a long shot or something that would be um, impractical or there's like the lack of support for even that. And so um, I wanted to be a playwright and I thought, you know, I'll, I had a whole plan in my head about, you know, writing plays and putting them on in garages and maybe like teaching English to some teenagers, to some scrappy teenagers. And, and then I uh, actually really, my life was really changing because I went into, I have told Andrew Bujalski um, that he really changed my life because I went into the local video store um, that was um, in my Tribeca neighborhood, rest in peace. And I saw the movie Funny Ha Ha on the shelf and I picked it up, I was 20. And I watched it and I thought, this is a person who is close to my age, who clearly has limited resources, who is just setting up the camera and letting life happen. And it was almost like, I think we all have a moment where it's like the, the barrier to entry that we've had mentally for whatever we're pursuing falls away just a little bit. And for me, it was seeing that movie. Um, and from there, I started to really try to understand not how I could be a filmmaker in this sense, but how I could be a filmmaker in the sense of, you know, what is that? It was just when the PD 170 camera was coming out, and everyone was talking about how David Lynch had shot Inland Empire on this camera. And so I took all my babysitting money and, um, like, literally, that I had been like keeping basically in a piggy bank since high school, and went and bought this prosumer camera and started making short films in college, which led to making a sort of baby feature called Creative Nonfiction. And um, through my um, incessant uh, email harassment of various mumblecore filmmakers, I was able to learn more and more about what they were doing and figure out that South by Southwest was a place that, where Janet Pearson, who was new, who's an amazing woman, who was near, newly running the festival then, would be open to showing something. 
Um, graduated, moved back to New York, had a variety of jobs. I worked as a restaurant hostess. I worked as a babysitter. I worked in a cl baby's clothing store, literally like a store that sold like cashmere rompers, very, <laughs> very specific. This was pre-recession. And um, I was, and my first film was accepted to South by Southwest, creative nonfiction. Um, and that's when I sort of thought, is there a slightly more ambitious way to do this? And at the first festival, I had met a group of young men who had gone to NYU, Jody Lee Lipes, Kyle Martin, Sean Durkin, Antonio Campos, all of whom were starting to make movies on a much more ambitious level than I could conceive of. I look back now and they were still, you know, tiny, but to me, a film crew of six was like impossible to conceive of. And I started collaborating with Jody. That led to creative nonfic. I, that led to tiny furniture, and my my life was really blasted open by by that. And um, and so I feel a little bit because I didn't have like a sort of picture of what my career was going to look like. It was just this really desperate desire to tell stories and to figure out the kind of next best way to make things. That I've been doing that ever since. I probably could have stood. I probably could still stand to have like a slightly, slightly clearer picture about how it all fits together, but it's like the moment I finish something, I just become so obsessed with what the next thing's gonna look like, what kind of challenge it's gonna be, and, and I feel like that's led me here today. I mean, I know you're beyond garage theater, but I still wanna see that. I still wanna see <laughs> Lena Dunham presents garage theater. Well, maybe I'm gonna have the chance. I mean, <laughs> I will say that like anytime I do something that is, it's such a joy always to work with a big film crew, but anytime I get to do something that is stripped down and small, and scrappy, like I made a film last year called Sharp Stick that we shot at the end of 2020, um, really in the COVID bubble, pre-vaccine, very small crew, 14 day shoot. And just being back in that space, that sort of where kids putting on a play space, um, I just, I always will be attracted to the kind of community and ingenuity that comes from limited resources, which yeah. is something I always say, when I meet young or aspiring filmmakers who are frustrated by the scale on which they're able to do things, is that I feel like some of them, like, I'm not trying to bemoan the amazing chance to make other things, but I feel like um, it's a reminder to me to always appreciate the resources I have when I have them because yeah. of the, of what it does, what does come out of being forced to kind of strip down and strip back and tell stories in that way. So maybe the garage theater will happen. That's. I mean, I, I really hope so. And that's a, an amazing story. I didn't realize you'd been inspired by mumblecore filmmakers. Like, that's awesome. I didn't even know what mumblecore was until I started working at Film Independent in 2007, 2008. Well, I just remember thinking, like, I saw Andrew Bujalski's movie, which led me to seeing Joe Swanberg, which led me to um, seeing... I had actually gone to high school with Rai Russo Young, who was also working with those people, and I started to work with her. We wrote a screenplay together, um, and just you know, Greta Gerwig, you know, it was really interesting. That was when Barry Jenkins was just putting out Medicine for Melancholy. And it was a really, I literally, you know, saw his first shorts on MySpace. And it was a really amazing moment because, you know, it's like, the only analogy I could say is like film for a second almost felt like indie rock or like garage yeah, rock. Yeah. Not that I know what that is. I'm a complete and total nerd. But, but that being said, like, I think that it felt really alive and really specific. And you never know when you're living through a really kind of cool cultural moment that it was that. But I look back and um, I ran into somebody who I knew from that kind of South by Southwest period last night. And I just thought like, what a amazing moment that we lived through of getting to make movies. I remember seeing the Duplass Brothers first movie that they did on an iPhone that was about an answering machine, like a botched, <laughs> answering machine recording and just being, but I also was also very conscious of the fact that most of these filmmakers were men and most of these filmmakers. Was that before Puffy Chair or after? That was before Puffy before Chair. Pu wow, that was pre-Puffy Chair. I was a pre-Puffy Chair Duplass Brothers wow. early adapter. And, okay. and all of those filmmakers are incredible, but I was like, Ryan, I would often talk about the fact that we were dealing in a complete boys club. We didn't know any women who worked on crews. We didn't know any, it was a very, cis white male environment and so trying to figure out how to sort of understand those resources and then use them to tell the kinds of stories that interested us was something we were always talking about yeah uh yeah i think it's amazing i mean you, you mentioned 
uh, you know, the funny thing about it is so many people made fun of mumblecore. And, but I really do think when you look back now, like so many of the filmmakers now sort of stood on their, are standing on their shoulders. And well, you mentioned Antonio Campos, like he just did the staircase on HBO. <laughs> yeah, no, and Sean Durkin has a show yeah. coming out. And I mean, these it's funny because it was a moment where it was easy to make fun of the idea of like these kind of hipsters improvising in their garages, but it did have a kind of um, ingenuity to it, I think, that hadn't come around in a while. And like all movements, every film doesn't age perfectly. I wouldn't say that my work from that time ages perfectly. And, but I think that there, and also it was easy for people to say it was craftless, but I think there was a craft to it and there was a style to it. And there's so many, there were just so many smart um, and really like really innovative people who were around in that moment. But yes, the mumblecore jokes come strong and steady. I think the, <laughs> it probably could have stood to have a better name. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly where that came from. It was, we could have called it like, like, um, like, uh, Early aughts naturalism or something. I mean, it, f it feels like all the core words came out from Mumblecore too, like cottage core, like that totally became yeah, like a... Yeah, there's, there's a lot of core happening. Yeah. And <laughs> so let's talk about Catherine Colberti. This film's phenomenal. Thank I love you. it so much. I've been recommending it to all my friends for a whole month. That and means um, so much. Uh, this is adapted from a YA novel, young adult yeah. novel from 1994. Yep. How, so how did you come in contact with the novel and then want to adapt it into a film? I came into contact with it on the new releases ch soft cover children's shelf at the Barnes and Noble in Union Square, um, oh. where my dad would take me every Saturday. And it was one of those books that you pick up and you realize by the time you've left. Oh, so you've known this from way back. I you read were it like an OG lover 10. of this book. Wow. I read it for okay. the first time when I was 10, and then it became like, you know, we all have that sort of book that's like a safety book, and it became that for me. I realized, like, I would probably reread it once, twice a year. It just was, I think there were so many books where I had admired the heroines, but there were very few where I had identified with them. And I also loved historical fiction, the way, like, some kids, like, this was my Harry Potter. It was like, I, the way that some kids become obsessed and kind of, like, disappear into the cavern of their imagination. Like, this was that for me. And she's written a series, Karen Cushman, the author, has written a series of incredible books for young readers, as she would call them, um, and about um, kind of children living through complex historic periods. I could just picture you at 10 saying to your friends something like, oh my God, you guys, the 1200s were so cool. <laughs> you have to read this book. If I'd had any friends, I would have said that to them. <laughs> so... Um, the, so did you read quite a bit of YA and do you have, what's your relationship with YA? Because I think, I feel like sometimes people make fun of YA, like we're talking people make, making fun of Mumblecore or they kind of downplay the importance of YA. I'm wondering Completely. your opinion of YA. I really am pretty, I really love children's literature. Like that sort of my, if I want, like I love, there's some YA books I absolutely adore too and I think YA is in important genre and I think people make fun of YA the same way that people make fun of young people in any genre that is specifically designated for teenage girls or young queer people is always made fun of whether it's like you know like comic books or boy bands or like there's a way that that vocations that are given to people young people it's like people don't make fun of high school sports these are things that are so important to the emotional and intellectual development of young people. I love children's literature just because I think there's something about just reverting to that child mind space that's absolutely unbelievable. And so I was always really obsessed with things like, you know, Eloise and um, and I loved I loved um, all of the uh, Marie Sendak books and like animated, playful. Um, and this book kind of felt like it was the like just the continuation of that. And it's funny because as a kid, I read a lot of books for adults. Like I was the kid who like stole Lolita off my parents' shelf because I yeah. heard it had sex scenes and read it and was like, I couldn't find a single one because I didn't understand anything I was reading. Yeah, I read the I read my mom's copy of uh, Color Purple at like eleven. 
Somebody asked me what I thought about the lesbian content in it, and I was like, what? Yeah, you <laughs> totally. It's a lesbian. <laughs> um, but but um, I really got excited about the idea. I mean, I've been trying to make this movie for 10 years, but when I, I loved the idea of making something, speaking of YA, you know, film for me as a, as a young teenager was so important, especially being someone who felt a little bit socially isolated. So whether it was, you know, Clueless or A League of Their Own or Slums of Beverly Hills, like these were these movies that just totally formed my identity. And I was really excited about trying to make a film that could be sort of appropriate for um, younger viewers, but also kind of just honored their intelligence and like the how much they do know and wasn't pandering and didn't assume that their primary interests were romance or, you know, popularity or, and so I felt like insofar as I know what a good role model is, that this character is a really great role model. And I was excited by the idea that there could be a movie that the way that, you know, my father, I just remembered that my last night that my dad and I, when I was 11 got there was a sold out show so we went to go see original sin together and like i had a panic attack like and my dad was just like i don't know what to do i've made a huge mistake but <laughs> that's like a really has a really gnarly sex scene and like that was like famed at the time angelina jolie antonio banderas but most of the time we went to see appropriate movies together and the way that that interge- the way that we could talk about so many hard topics that were hard to broach you know, I found that often the only way that I could talk to my parents, even though they were very open about things like feeling socially isolated or confused about, you know, certain ideas or yearnings, was when there was like a piece of art that reflected those feelings that we could then discuss together. And so I loved the idea of trying to make a movie that was that kind of touch point for young people and their families. Hopefully, that was the dream. So in terms of writing, is this your first project that was an adaptation and not um, all, the, all the ideas coming from you? You know, when um, I co-created Camping with Jenny Connor, that was adapted from a UK format, which is sort of a different thing, but, but has similar, similar aspects. But this was, and I had adapted novels unsuccessfully, not to, not made, taking them to screen before. But I felt like this was the first successful adaptation I did insofar as A, it got made, but B, it um, it felt like it was the first time I'd really been able to capture the spirit of the thing that I loved in the thing that I was writing. And the interesting thing about adapting is that it's not necessarily about taking the plot verbatim, but it's about like keeping the kernel of the thing that made you love the original so much and making yeah. sure that even if an audience has no, because has anyone here read Catherine Called Birdie? See, it's, oh, we've got one oh. that's so thrilling. Oh, oh, we've got yes. some YA lovers. Um, thank you. It thank must you. Have, I must have felt like a lot of pressure because I've heard this book was very well loved by you and many, many, many other people. It was very it well loved like by me and it was very pressure. well loved by a very specific, like I read an article four years ago in Nylon that was amazing that was somebody talking about how Catherine Called Birdie was their way of figuring out their queerness or an amazing comic was in the Times a few years ago about someone talking about how it was her escape from her household as a kid. Like, it wasn't the most popular book. It didn't sell, you know, it didn't sell crazy commercial numbers, but the people who love it really love it. Right. And so it's one of those kind of cult things. Must be how my husband feels about Sandman. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, because um, he was really panicked. He did approve of the adaptation, but he was very panicked before we watched. Um, but I think that it's, it was, it, I wanted to make sure that I did right by the author, who I love so much, Karen, who is 80 and lives on Vashon Island off Seattle and is a total badass. And by this book that had meant so much to me. And then as the cast and crew also started to fall in love with the characters in the story, I felt like, okay, we've really got to try to bring this home. So you were originally supposed to shoot this in 2000, right? And then got derailed by the pandemic. The pandemic, we were about to shoot. We were supposed to shoot in April, 2020. And you can all imagine what happened. Um, and you know, we got that call and I thought like, okay, we'll be down for a week. Like I can, learn to do yoga and then 
Um, and then obviously um, it didn't happen. And of course there were many more tragic things than the film not getting to go. But I was at the time so bereft and disappointed and and concerned that it wouldn't happen again. Um, and I'm so grateful because Amazon took the movie after um, you know it had that experience of getting an, the old Hollywood drop and um, they took it and really guided it beautifully. And the pandemic ended up being um, that time, I'm really grateful for it because the script actually changed a lot in that time of me just being, like I had a movie that was totally ready to go with a basically completely different third act and, and the pandemic allowed the space to reflect um, more, to think about my cast doing these things, to dream and to ultimately come up with an ending that felt like it was better suited. So you completely changed the third act. Yeah. In, in your downtime. In, our, in the downtime, I was like, let's make a couple tweaks here. And a couple tweaks turned into wow. a totally, the entire sword fight and her father um, coming to her aid was- is, is that very you to rewrite very much? You know, I tend to rewrite a lot right up into the point that we go, and then often, um, you know, through rehearsal process, I'll also make changes with the actors. And then on the day, once we have a blocking rehearsal, once I start to understand, okay, often then I'll even go, you know what, I realized half of the stuff in this scene we actually don't need, and just start Xing out lines, which some people love and some people love less. <laughs> um, but... I really, I always tend to think like until you are shooting that there's always potentially a better version. And then even after you're shooting, which is why editors are so brilliant. So let's talk about Bella Ramsey and your other cast. What a Bella star. Ramsey, who I don't know if anybody else did, but the minute you saw her on Game of Thrones was like, I really hope that she's going to be huge because she is amazing. Like, who is that girl? Yes, and I had that experience, and everyone I know had that experience. I mean, whenever I told anyone who I cast, and they'd go, who's Bella Ramsey? What have they been in? And I would say, they were that tiny little warlord on the last season of Game of Thrones, and they'd be like, oh, my fucking God. And she really, I mean, anytime I post, it's just like 1,000 people writing Lady Marmont in all capital letters, which I love. And what's amazing is that was her first role. She was 11. She had barely been acting. She was in a theater troupe in Leicester, where she comes from in England. And Nina Gold, our casting director, went looking for people for this role and found Bella. And a few weeks later, she was on set on Game of Thrones. And she is an incredibly fast learner, like a complete... I would say she's a savant, except she's good at so many things. She's She makes music. There's a song of hers in this film that she did with my husband. Um, and she, um, Nina suggested, when I sent the script to Nina Gold, she said, I think I know the person for this. And she showed me the picture of Bella. And I recognized, I was like, oh, I, can't. I was angry that I didn't think of it myself. And I felt at that moment like there was just absolutely no one else who could do the role. And that was one of my terrors actually during the pandemic was I was like, I don't know if I can make this movie without Bella. And if two years go by and I see Bella and she has grown into like a full, you know, that's always the thing with shooting with young people. It's like, you don't want to say it, but they do grow. And at a certain point, no longer look 14. Um, so I felt terrible. I'd like be zooming with her and I'd be like, just let me know if you've grown any inches in any way. Um, but she is just, um, she's everything. Like she's every, she's as, as wonderful as I think she is as an actor. She's, how, how old was she when you started shooting? When we started shooting, she was 17. 17. She okay. was 17. I, we cast her when she was 15. She, we started shooting when she was 17 and she's 19 now. And um, as wonderful as she is as an actor, and you guys will see more, she's on this show called The Last of Us that's coming on HBO. As wonderful as she is as an actor, she is more remarkable as a person. And, you know, it takes a lot to be the, the number one on a call sheet. It's like a, a real responsibility. And, and if someone has negativity or um, even a lot of insecurity, it can bring a, a really different energy to set. And just people were in awe of Bella every single day. And I mean, I'm, she's killing it from the first second. And I was just so delighted. But also, the whole rest of your cast is too. And all those scenes that she has with Morwenna, 
that like veteran U- UK actress. Isn't she incredible? I- I'm blanking. What's Leslie her? Sharp. I cast. She's been in so many things. Well, I've been obsessed with her ever since because of Mike Lee's Naked. Yes. And she has this incredible role in Naked. And I, th- and then she's done so many interesting films, so much it's theater, so much television. I mean, she just Didn't like. Did she do Full Monty? The movie Full Monty? I think she did. Yeah. She's been in everything. Yeah. But I, Naked was my sort of, my foray, my entree into her. And, um, and she's incredible. I mean, that, she just came in and was like, I think she might be Scottish. I think she might have walked all the way from the Scottish Highlands and asked for a job. And I was like, great, done. <laughs> like, who am I to argue with that logic? In the last, in the wedding scene, she's holding her real life dog, Mrs. Miggins. She just was like, I think I should hold Mrs. Miggins in the scene again. And you're like, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. So let's talk about Andrew Scott, the beloved. Um, I heard that uh, Rollo is one of the characters that's changed quite a bit from the book. Um, can you talk about like how he has changed? Yeah, well, so once we cast Belle, I wanted to cast from the from the child outward and make sure that the parents felt like they reflected who she was. And then I saw her and I was like, well, I feel like that person's father is, you can see it, obviously Andrew Scott, he created that child. And I really think he had, you never know in films if it feels like people are a successful family. It's one of the leaps of faith that we have to take in movies, although families look all different ways. And um, I just think they they really make a, a handsome trio. But um, but I f- I was desperate for him to do the role. And in the book, it's a much more brutish part. It's like a belching, raging, kind of lecherous man. And Andrew and I had a discussion, and he was really honest. He was like, "I really love the characters. I really love the script. I feel like he is feeling a little bit like a sort of cartoon of." this idea of like, let's call it toxic masculinity. And I really, obviously Andrew's honesty made me even more, it's like someone being like, I'm interested, but I'm not really sure that we would make a great couple. And you're like, we would make a great couple. Um, <laughs> and so I, I started to just to talk to him about who the character could be. And this idea that maybe he also feels very trapped by the, by the time and by the expectations of the time. And the thing is, is that sort of, you know, we all suffer under the gender binary. So the idea that only women are suffering from our ideas of what femininity needs to look like leaves out the idea that there's also an enormous amount of pressure when men are forced to conform to ideas of what masculinity needs to look like. And so that was sort of the jumping off point for us talking about this character. And then we just started to really make ourselves laugh with like the idea of like, what if he kind of is like the equivalent of like a dad? I always kind of talked about them as the equivalent of like people on the Real Housewives of New Jersey who kind of buy a McMansion that they can't afford and then like the power keeps getting shut off and they're always like, you know, wearing like matching Gucci track suits. Like I was sort of being like, well, who is their modern equivalent yeah. that we can talk about? And it's, and what would this be? And their kind of pretensions around class, which is very English, but also very everywhere. And so Andrew and I really started, I like how I keep looking up at him like he's here. Um, Andrew and I started to, he's always with us all, but he started to talk about who he could be. And then we got this kind of pearl necklace wearing dandy, dancing dandy. And I just, I, he just, someone, my favorite, do any of you do letterboxed? Isn't it such a good app? I'm in no way paid to say that. I just love Letterboxd. It's like the only social media app, like even when people are mean, they're so smart that it's okay. <laughs> Whereas on other apps, you're like, you didn't even try to spell that. But, um, but um, someone was like, I love this movie in which Andrew Scott plays Patsy from Absolutely Fabulous. And I was like, yep, 100%. I, f- I feel like he gets the most difficult parts because he has to be the baddie in this and yet is still really likable at times. But but also he, he's the one that has to force his wife to try to have babies over and over and again. And you're just like, do I like this guy? I don't know. It was so cute and flea bag. I, I know. And he's then confusing me. He's confusing me too. But then he really, I think, kind of like what we wanted to make sure was that you understood that even though he did things that we would consider to be totally quite kind of dark-sided as the kids say um 
I think that's what the kids say. My brother was like, kids don't say that. But, um, <laughs> but I think that he is always like working from this place of passion and intensity and love for his family and lack of love for himself. And I feel like Andrew is such a complicated, it takes a very complicated performer, a very smart performer to be able to do something that's that layered. Like, you know, something I always thought about on Girls was like Adam Driver played a man who in some scenes seemed like a romantic hero and in some scenes really bordered on like near sociopathic disregard for other people. And it takes a very nuanced, complicated performer to be able to move between those two polarities and keep you engaged and keep you rooting for them. And he's so good at doing that. And I also love actors specifically male actors who don't have a fear of always needing to look like the good guy or the cool guy. And Andrew really just wants to do the truthful thing. Um, and I just, I hope I get to work with him over and over again. I admire him so Yeah, much. I mean, by the time you get to the end and he gets stabbed, I'm like, no! I know. We had a big I debate know. about like how big should the cut be? Should we think he's going to die? It can't be so small that you just think he could put a Band-Aid on it. But... Um, but uh, yeah, that was my that was for sure my first sword fight. I was really nervous that morning because I was like, this is like some Ridley Scott shit up in here. <laughs> and then I realized it's like, you know, eight extras and two men fencing on a ball pile of hay. But it felt really big to me. Um, we've talked for a very long time and I think probably you want to go soon. But I was wondering, um, I, I want to say feel long because I'm with you. <sighs> I'm with you all. It's so sweet, Lena. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, I mean, it was very exciting to me to find out that you're doing movies again. Is, is, is that the direction that you're heading again? I wouldn't be upset if you headed back to TV at all. Well, thank you. I still watch your stuff no matter what, but thank I was really you. excited to find you doing features again, so I'm just wondering I'm, if you're I'm doing more features. I'm certainly not going to take another 12 years off of making features. Like, <laughs> the bug bit me again, and I definitely need to be making movies, and I really feel like I... I'm so grateful for that time because it took me back. Um, it took me on a really interesting path and I feel like I sort of like acquired the skills necessary to push it. But I still feel like in some ways a baby feature filmmaker. Like this is still really new and thrilling to me. I hope it stays new and thrilling to me. So I am certainly going to keep making movies and I have a couple of TV things that I'm hoping to do as well. But I would like my future to um, really hold a balance of the two because I have been reminded that this was my first love for a reason and I love making TV and I love making film and I'm not doing a sort of uh, qualitative analysis, but they are truly different things. And I think there was a moment we sort of tried to decide they were all the same thing and for the sake of movie lovers and for TV lovers, we can establish that like, well, they share commonalities. They're different yeah. storytelling mediums. Right. Um, so this is currently on on Amazon, Amazon Prime until the end of time. Until the end of time, it's always going to be on Amazon. Until the end of time, when we are all living on Mars together, <laughs> um, living out our final days, it will still be on Amazon yeah. Prime. And uh, I'm going to say, you know what? I haven't seen in 50 years. Catherine called Birdie. Yes, let's fire it up. Let's. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Um, um, so you were telling me you also have a podcast. I do. What's it called? It's called The C Word. Uh -huh. Oh, my God. Really? Oh, my God. We have, we Alyssa's going to flip out about that cheer. Thank you. Oh God, I'm going to go tell her that these, this You have group some of podcast groupies here. Cheered, and she's going to be so happy. It's amazing. Um, Alyssa is like the most invested in heart right back. Alyssa's the most invested in everyone who listens to our podcast. She answers every comment. She's the queen of keeping tabs. So you guys, Alyssa says what up. Um, but uh, well, but our you. podcast is about women who've been considered the C word crazy throughout history <laughs> and kind of looking yeah. at um, what their lives, what in what culturally we project onto them and the deal with their lives. So we're always taking, you just gave me a potential yes. subject backstage. Did you do Mary Todd Lincoln? Very we famous, thought to be crazy <sighs> person. Oh, amazing one that we're constantly thinking about. And you guys can always nominate also by writing on Instagram. We're very engaged with our nominations. We just did a two-parter on Lindsay Lohan. And if you look at the Sunset Boulevard uh, uh, big billboard that's up, it says that the Lohanaissance is upon us. So just in time. You anticipated that. 
we felt it because we feel connected to her. Yeah. So we are always, it's, but it's always the low Hannah sense for us. It's a 24 seven thing. So makes sense. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you and to be here with all of you. And thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Thank you.